Good evening. If you have uh, your Bibles with you, uh, please turn with me on uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Listen now to God's word. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the, un the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truths abound to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. This is the, the word of the Lord. Before we uh, go to the preaching of the word, let me open a word of prayer for everybody. Oh, Father, direct our hearts, our mind, and for me, my mouth, that we may see Christ in this preaching, and that all distractions or any anxieties that we have be set aside, or at most will be gone, because this is a day of celebration, a day where we will listen to you, Father. We pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, give us the things that we need in order for us to glorify Christ and appreciate this day of worship. We give you thanks and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're now on Romans chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. Uh, in continuation with uh, my sermon series about the book of Romans or the uh, epistle of Romans. And today, um, we will be tackling um, verse 1 to 8 whereby I titled it as Divine Sovereignty and Human Responsibility. And then I have given two points for, for you. Uh, the first point is sovereign faithfulness. And for the kids, you can just uh, refer to the key point there as the word grace, not my wife. And second is man's objection, sin. Again, the second, the, the second point is a man's objection, or you can refer to it as sin. Okay? Grace and then sin. Now, I want to start it by saying first and share to you something uh, as a parent. Um, parents are naturally generous to their children. Um, the selfless act of giving to their kids is the byproduct of their faithfulness to them. It gives them joy and fulfillment whenever they provide for their children. When parents give to their children, they also assume that their children will take care of whatever tangible things they have given to them. Now, for the kids, as a way to requit or return that love to your parents in a form of respect, love, and honor, for, for that to actualize or materialize, the kids have to make sure that whatever tangible things have been given to them, they will be a good steward of that um, gift to them, right? And whatever gift is, has been given to them may it be material or something um, of uh, authority. Let's say you have been entrusted by your parents. You have to actualize it and honor it by making sure that you're being a good steward of that. But of course, there are times that our children are also failing to be a good steward of uh, this grace that we bestowed to them. Why did I use the word grace? I, I remember Pastor James uh, preaching about um, that particular matter, that most of the time kids, and for me, for, for Paige, for Nash, they cannot return anything to their parents. They cannot requit anything in terms of food, how, um, uh, shelter, clothes, they cannot requit. They just basically, uh, they just basically cling to us, right? And at times, um, 
they fail to requite that love back in a very simple way, like just honoring, you know, just following the commands of their parents, right? And here, as a faithful parents, what we do is that when that particular time comes, we normally step in. If they fail on something, if we have to correct them, we step in and rectify what is needed. As an example, in my household, don't worry, Ravi, you're not the example here. As an example, in our, house, uh, our household, every time someone has a birthday, my wife and I love to give them surprise gifts, of course. Something that they have been dreaming of or been planning to have. Whenever our kids talk to us about things that they want to have, most often than not, we normally say, magkakaroon ka rin yan. Sa tamang panahon, magpray ka lang. Or, wala tayong pera. Mag-aral ka na mabuti. Paglaki mo, bumili ka. <laughs> right? That's how we normally say it. We don't give them a clue that we are capable of buying it. Or rather, we don't give them a clue that we will buy it for them on their birthday. Because as parents, when you hear your kids asking for ch- such things, at the back of your head, you tend to analyze everything if that ask is within your capability. Because the presupposition of us parents is you want to give every lawful things to them. So when someone asks you, when, you're, when, you're, you're, when your kids ask you, Dad, I want this. the back of your head, a good parents will definitely consider that. Na, I will get that for you, my son. Right? But we're not going to do it in a reckless way, but in a matured way, right? This is because the reason we have that presupposition in our head as a parent that we love to give them and provide for them is because we love them. We love to surprise them and see their reactions. Well, for Nash, it's the same reaction. No, I'm just kidding. So as they enjoy the gift given to them from time to time, we often ask them, Kamusta na yung regalo ko sa'yo? Okay naman. Right? Nagamit mo naman, okay pa ba? We normally ask that to, the, to our kids. So. Why do we ask those things? A gift nga yan, kahit sirain nila yan, okay lang, right? For us, three folds, why we ask those things. Number one, we love to see how they enjoy the gift given to them. When they're enjoying it, we love it. Right? May fulfillment. Number two, we wanted to see if the item is durable and working properly. Right? Because there's warranty. Number three, we expect them to have that filial respect in taking care of things entrusted to them by their parents. And in times that our children squanders our gifts to the, as in broken talaga siya, sinira nila, we as parents, we ought, with authority, rebuke, correct them, but at the same time, despite of that happenings, we faithfully and continually love them and still give them gifts. Right? Our kids' disobedience does not nullify our love for them. But the more we want to help them change. Now, listen kids. The disobedience of our, of our kids are not necessary in this life in order for the parents' kindness to be magnified. Right? Hindi kailangan maging pasawa yung bata para masabing mabait yung magulang. Right? But, it does, but this doesn't change the fact that just because our parents are kind, we can recklessly be insubordinate. Okay? Today, this is relatable on our passage. And the big idea of the passage is that the Lord is the covenant-keeping God who is sovereign in all creation and in whatever that will come to pass. He decrees of the things to come, but He does not deny human responsibility but is rather part of it, consistent to man's nature, may he be a new man, regenerate, or old, unregenerate. His faithfulness does not rest upon man's unfaithfulness, but in his nature. Right? So let's go to the first point, verses 1 to 4. Grace. In our text today, Paul continues to unpack his argument against man's futile excuses against God's sovereignty. Right? In fact, later on, he will address the problem of antinomianism. Paul begins this portion of his episode by answering an imaginary interlocutor or debate partner. Sa mga kids, Paul is like having a shadow boxing with a debate partner. So it's like talking to someone, arguing with someone, but reality, wala naman talaga. It's an imaginary debate, debating partner. On the first chapter, he tackled the sinfulness of humanity and the grievous idolatry that they, they engage in. And the likely response would be, that's all fine and unsurprising. 
pagans, of course, are naturally sinful. But Paul then shifted his attention to his fellow Jews to demonstrate that they do too are guilty of gross sins like the pagans. And despite of being born in the covenant, privileged they have neglected their responsibilities. Despite of being chosen people of God's covenant, their possession of the law and circumcision, the sign of God's covenant was not enough. The thing is, what is the benefit of this privileged status if they are just as sinful as the pagan? Now, in Romans verse uh, 1, chapter 3, verse 1, Paul's candid response is very simple and on point. That their advantage lies in the fact that God committed Himself sovereignly and made a covenant with them. It is God who committed Himself to them, not them. And made a covenant with them. This was revealed through His oracles, his revelation and word to them. You can read that in verse 2. They had the privilege of knowing the will of God when for a thousand of years, Gentiles' nations sat in darkness. Jews cannot brag anything because this post fall revelation of God to their nation was solely driven by God's grace alone. His sovereign special goodness to them is not driven by the uniqueness of their ethnicity or based from what they can offer for we all know all men came from Adam, and through Adam, sin came to the world. God's sovereignty is no respecter of ethnicity. He will show mercy to anyone He chooses, and He will show compassion to anyone He chooses. We can read that in Romans chapter 9, verse 15. He yields to no one. God is not just sovereign, even for circumcision, the value of the Jew's circumcision lies to God's sovereignty in that His faithfulness to those whom He will claim, the Mark ones and their progeny, including women, He will certainly fulfill His promises to them. God sovereignly gave Abraham and his descendants the mark of circumcision as a physical reminder that they were cut, up, cut, cut out from the world, that is, set apart to serve the one true Lord. You can read that in Genesis 17, verse 1 to 14. Every male that was circumcised under the administration of the covenant of grace, along with his family, branded by Yahweh. Even though God as the, the universe, he is the universe sovereign, owns everything he has made, Psalm 50 verse 10, he revealed that he owns the covenant community in a unique way by his mark of circumcision. Romans chapter 4 verse 11 described the old covenant sacrament of circumcision as a seal of righteousness. Now, in the ancient world, letters were often marked with wax on which a seal from a ring or other object was impressed. So, um, if you guys are part of History Channel, you know, there's a, um, a letter being sent by the king. They're going to put some wax and then the king is going to stamp his ring there. No? The seal proved ownership, indicating that the letter came from the person represented by the seal. Now, similarly, the sacraments are visible mark that God owns us, not us owning God and professing allegiance to Him. Right? They show that we have been set apart from the world as His people. Now, if God is sovereign, right, what if some did not believe? This is what the text says. Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Of course, that's a rhetorical ask by Paul. And he answered it swiftly by saying directly, by no means. Right? Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Just because some of the Jews did not believe does not disprove of God's faithfulness to his word. This is like you know the first part that I shared earlier about continually giving my kids gift, despite of sometimes they're squandering it, right? Just because some of the Jews did not believe does not disprove God's faithfulness to His Word. Promises or covenants. Paul asserts faithfulness of God by saying all men are liars in comparison with His faithfulness and veracity. To substantiate this, his point, he quoted Psalm 51 verse 4. The original context of Psalm 51 verse 4 was from David's prayer of repentance when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. 
and killed her husband Uriah the Hittite. David's point is that when people sin, God is justified in judging them for their disobedience because ultimately, sin is against God. Therefore, God faithfully fulfills His promises to grant salvation by circum- circumcising the heart of His people, and He is also faithful and righteous when He punishes unbelief. In other words, in line with Paul's thesis in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the gospel reveals God's righteousness, which He demonstrates in salvation of His covenant people and the judgment of unbelievers. Even those within the covenant community, you know, now, salvation from our sins and the punishment of our sin was seen vividly in the cross of Christ. Since only this grace is stronger than the forces of sin, it brings genuine and lasting freedom from sin's dominion. Now, this idea that salvation owes everything to God's grace is an overarching theme not just in Romans, but in all Paul's epistles. Salvation flows from a divine work that persists day by day despite man's struggle and setbacks. A work that most certainly will be perfected in the great day. Everything is to the praise of the glory of the triune God. Now, in the words of Samuel Rutherford, he said, God's seed will come to God's harvest. And in the words of Joel Beakey regarding sovereign grace, he said, grace calls us, Galatians 1.15, regenerates, regenerates us, justifies us, sanctifies us, and preserves us. We need grace to forgive us, to return us to God, to heal our broken hearts, and to strengthen us in times of trouble and spiritual warfare. Only by God's free sovereign grace can we have a saving relationship with Him. Only through grace can we be called to conversion, holiness, service, even suffering. That's how beautiful God's sovereignty is. But then Paul raises another question. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in human way. Of course, sabi ni Paul, no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abound to His glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying their condemnation is just. This leads us to the second point. A man's objection. There's one thing good about man is trying to find objections on God's holiness and righteousness. After the fall, man will try his best to... Uh, Pit God's attributes against him. Election does not invalidate the important truth of human responsibility. Again, election does not invalidate the important truth of human responsibility, which is what Paul addresses on the following verses. He refutes two sinful blame shifting objections of man. Two sinful blame shifting objections of man. Number one, how can God judge us for our sin? If it helps him by showing forth his righteousness. That's the first objection. Second objection, if it's only by God's electing grace that he circumcises a man's heart, then how can God judge us for our sins? Now, for the deluded sinful person, the action of blame shifting is the only way of escape. We have seen so many atheists playing the card of the what-if life director. A what-if life director. They like to simulate things. What if life, right? By saying, if God is God, why did He allow some to remain on their sins? And at the same time, blaming them. Atheists would say, if God wills good to prevail, then why did He allow evil people to trample good people? That's a classic uh, hate speech right there. Without evil, God's goodness will not be magnified. Necessary evil, right? The presupposition of these people is the problem. It's not God, their presupposition. The dark slate of their heart and mind is the problem. No amount of intelligent discussion alone can change their heart. Their logic can be seen in this story. Let me uh, give you a story that perhaps will give some um, 
train of uh, thinking how the atheists, you know, think. A good engineer named Alex made the hanging bridge with ropes as the main support to help the locals pass from one mountain to another. Now, the bridge rope is quite sturdy and lasting. One day, a wicked merchant came who is on a rush to travel his books. Good books. He said, this bridge is too long. I need to find a way how to save time crossing it. What if I tie myself up to the bridge ropes, then cut it loose so I can swing to the other side much faster? So lo and behold, he started tying himself to the end of the bridge rope and started sewing and cutting the other ends of the ropes. After much time and effort, the bridge collapsed. He was able to swing to the other side with much velocity, a la Indiana Jones, with adventurous, uh, you know, ropes and all. But there was a problem. He tied himself completely on the end of the ropes that he cut, leaving him at the bottom of the ropes. So it's like hanging here, right? Unfortunately, he cannot pull himself up because his bag is too heavy, a lot of books. It prevents him to do so. Minutes and hours have passed. He feared for himself. He get anxious and he was so angry. This is what he said. He's yelling. Whoever made this bridge, you are an imbecilic being. For making it too long, now I'm stuck here and perhaps will die here. You could have found other ways to make it more convenient for me. After hours have passed, a boy playing with some rocks near the bridge saw the merchant. The boy said, Hey, mister, what have you done? The man said, Can't you see? I destroyed the bridge so that the man who made this bridge can see how pathetic his bridge is. And the boy said, Oh, he is a good man. He made this for all the people who want to travel fast across mountains. But now, it's gone. Earlier, I saw you spending three hours cutting the bridge rope. While you're doing it, me and my friends have passed the bridge back and forth because we're waiting for a book merchant. I heard he is smart as his books are. The merchant said, well, I am the book merchant. And the child said, oh, okay, never mind the books. Goodbye, mister. Now, surely this example is not perfect, but there is a grain of truth how an atheist thinks. Because of his self-centered nature, this fool wasted much of his time tying himself, cutting the ropes, sewing the ropes without thinking of others who will later use the bridge, and ultimately without showing gratitude to the ones who built the bridge. He just wanted to reinvent the bridge for his own desire, but ended destroying the bridge and dying by hanging on the bridge alone without any help. Now, should we blame the bridge maker? Their sinful heart will always deny God's goodness. They will use his sovereignty against him. They will always use his attributes against him. But never will they use their own sinful nature against themselves to self-examine. They will never do that. Because they are the standard of what is right and wrong. The good engineer doesn't need this merchant's foolishness to show his intelligence and kindness to the locals. The merchant's foolishness is not needed as an evidence to bring forth to life the merchant's good heart. Good heart. God's decrees are always righteous, holy, and without any blemish of sin. The act of man's unbelief was part of his plan, but the act of unbelief was authored by man himself. As man's heart is a foundry of sin, his acting is always according to his own nature. Man meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The moment you hear from a person where he or she spits, pits God's attributes against God, most often than not, that person hates God and his gospel. So when you hear an atheist say, if he's... If he's uh, all-powerful, why can't he draw a square circle? 
Can you ask that person, can you draw a square circle? No, I'm just a man. That's why I'm telling your God to draw a square circle. It's like asking God to do foolish things like you. God would never think of a square circle. Only sinful man would think like that. You, you cannot force God. God, you should say 1 plus 1 equals 4. Only man can think of such weird things like that. Grisha Machen comments about God's plan and decrees. This is very helpful. He said, Machen said, When God causes the bringing to pass of the evil actions of men, He does that, he does that it, it's still a different way. He does not tempt the men to sin. He does not influence them to sin. But He causes the bringing to pass of those deeds by the free and responsible choice of persons, personal beings. He has created those beings with the awful gift of freedom of choice. The things that they do not, they, that they do in exercise of that gift are their acts. They do not indeed surprise God by doing of them. Their doing of them is part of His eternal plan. Yet, in the doing of them, they and not the Holy God are responsible. What is the real difficulty here, Machen said? Is it the difficulty of harmonizing the free will of the creature with the certainty of the creature's action as part of God's eternal purpose? No, I do not think that that is the real difficulty. The real difficulty is the difficulty of seeing how a good and all-powerful God ever could have allowed sin to enter the world that He created. Is it, so, is it so surprising that there are some things that we do not know? God has told us much. He has told us much even about sin. He has told us how an infinite cause, by the gift of His Son, He has provided a way of escape from it. Yes, God has told us much. Is it surprising that He has not told us all? We have so many problems in the world and you want God to draw a square circle. Now, so much for the atheists, the foolish atheists. What about those people who are in the covenant community? How can we apply this second point? The main application of the second point is to beware of antinomianism. Now, throughout the first two chapters of Romans, Paul challenged the various areas in which the Jews would try to take refuge to secure their salvation. Paul said they could not be saved because of heritage. Mere possession of the law or circumcision. So yes, the Jews perverted and had a ten tendency toward works righteousness, trying to add their moral effort to God's grace, a la legalism. But at the same time, they also had a tendency towards antinomianism. In previous sermon, the Jews preach against certain sins, yet commit those very sins, sins themselves. Remember, Paul said, you then who teaches others, do you not teach yourself? Well, you preach against stealing, do you steal? Remember that passage, right? Perhaps they thought God would overlook their sins because they were His covenant people. Yet Paul demonstrates that antinomianism is equally unacceptable to God because it is veiled behind a veneer piety. Antinomianism is veiled behind a veneer piety. This is the false notion. God is in the business of forgiving sins. Sure, I'm a sinner, therefore, I'm okay. We must remember that there are covenantal blessings and curses, gospel threats. You can read that in the Canons of Dort. There's gospel threats for the covenant breakers. Just as the Jew turned his circumcision into uncircumcision, a person can, for example, turn blessing of the Lord's Supper into a curse. Anytime we become indifferent towards God's law, we made into the dark, murky waters of antinomianism. Again, anytime we become indifferent to the, towards God's law, we made into the dark, murky water of antinomianism. As an example, we tend to bank on not to create graven images as a reform, but we create ourselves the graven images of our life. We make ourselves the chief end of our life in so many different ways. Example, living a reckless lifestyle and not regarding our health in all that we do. We call out murderers and yet we murder ourselves slowly 
by being not a good steward of God's provision in food, in work, in lifestyle. We call out lazy people because perhaps we have never been arbitrarily absent or late at work most of the time. But some of you have, have and has been absent for quite a long time on the Lord's Day consistently. If I be absent in work, I might get penalized and lose my job. If I be absent on the Lord's Day, they should understand. I'm tired. Right? I don't want to play a Paul Washer card here and say, why are you laughing? Right? But I'm not going to do that. I'm not the Baptist, you know. <laughs> but, you have more fear in man than God. You fear more your boss than God. Some reform called out prosperity preachers, but the opposite side of it is that they have become a church leech who doesn't practice their gifts, doesn't want to participate in any church activity that involves them giving financially in the church. They just want to take and take and take. The sin of antinomianism goes not just for the members, but even to office bearers. Sometimes we only discipline for, for, for all elders, Sometimes we only discipline those with X, Y, Z sins, but those sins that are pretty obvious, that are yelling in our face, we don't care. Example, weekly Sabbath breaking due to X, Y, Z controllable matters. Elders, let it slide. Maybe because we are afraid to lose members or maybe numbers, or perhaps to be called unloving, judgmental, or inconsiderate elders. We passively tell ourselves, oh, let me pray for you. But secretly, I will not exercise authority over you in disciplining or counseling. I don't want confrontation. It's too taxing. I'm doing a lot of things, you know. I'm a church. I'm a tent maker. I am elder on a Sunday and not an elder on Monday to Friday. I will allow the Lord to deal with them. God commanded us to discipline the sheep. We can view that in Matthew 18 and 1 Timothy chapter 5. But because what kind of a father would allow his son to continue his drug addiction and say, Oh, I cannot intervene because I'm a loving father. And I don't want to be called unloving and uncharitable. I will just wait for God to remove his addiction. We become an instrument of their antinomianism. Church leaders never confuse firm discipline with love over fake love that condones sin. There are two kinds of sinful church leaders. Those who are tyrant, who kills and consume the sheep for their own sake, and those who are futile leaders, who allow the sheep to die on their own sins because they are not committed and doesn't want to be accountable to them. The common denominator, denominator of these two leaders is that both of them have no love for the flock and Jesus Christ. The former is outrightly unloving, and the latter is subtly unloving. Hindi gano obvious. Right? Paul's warning to his fellow Israelites are equally applicable to the church in our own day. Also, we, we must remember for everyone, mere presence within the church proximity does not shelter one from God's wrath. As Paul proves proximity to Christ and the gospel guarantees nothing. Only faith alone to Christ and the gospel constitute the divine embassy of peace and refuge from our sin and God's judgment. Praise be to God for He is sovereignly faithful in that He doesn't allow His sons to die and drown on their own sins. Even though sometimes some believers have a very weak leader's weak elders, weak pastor, or a tyrant pastor, the Lord is sovereign. He will bring His children to the right place, the right time, with the right people. But does that mean that we, as people of God, will wait for that? We pray for it. We pray for it. We ask for counsel. But we have to act on it because you have your, you, you're a new being. You're, you have a new nature. If it's so difficult for you to act on your new nature, mag-isip na kayo. Right?
Praise be to God for He is sovereignly faithful in that He doesn't allow His sons to die and drown on their own sins. He uses sovereign decrees to drive them to the right church where the gospel is preached and with the people who are shaped by the gospel. This should bring us to our knees in that without God's faithful sovereignty, what will happen to us? Sa Tagalog, saan tayo pupulutin kung wala ang Panginoon? In the last sermon, Brother Ed Cal uses the word matigas sa mukha sa harap ng Diyos. I want to highlight that, right? And I want to use that word in saying, sa tigas ng mukha nating lahat, saan tayo pupulutin kung wala si Kristo? So are we to sin that grace may abound? Together with Paul, we will say, certainly not. For it is written, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Walk in them, beloved. This is human responsibility. As a covenant member, our duty is to love God and love our neighbor just as ourselves. Let me end with a Puritan prayer from the Valley of Vision. Have mercy on me, for I have ungratefully received thy benefits. Little improve my privileges. Made light of spiritual things. Disregarded your messages. Contended with examples of the good rebukes of conscience. Admonition of friends. Leading of providence. I deserve that your kingdom may be taken away from me. Lord, I confess my sin with feeling, lamentation, a broken heart, a contrite spirit, self-abhorrence, self-condemnation, self-despair. Give me relief by Jesus' hope. Faith is in His name of Savior, forgiveness by His blood, strength by His presence, holiness by His Spirit, and let me love thee with all my heart. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're glad because we arrogant beings have a sovereign, faithful, holy God who is always there for us, who is always there for us, who enables us. We ask for the Holy Spirit power to enable us and always keep us on track in terms of our journey here in sanctification and in times that we, were, we will veer towards the wrong direction, Lord, always remind us, discipline us, Lord, but at the same time, Lord, remind us of your love because we tend to forget because of our sinfulness. We give you thanks, Lord, for who you are, for without you, Lord, we're nothing. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.